consistently our partners for over the past 100 years. I'm going to introduce our panelists with that. First, our moderator today will be Mitchell Orenstein, who's a professor of Russian and Eastern U European Studies here at Pennsylvania State, or sorry, Pennsylvania University, excuse me. <laughs> Jackson James, senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Mr. Jan Sorochak, who is the senior director of the Transatlantic Strategy, excuse me, at the International Republican Institute. Ms. Alexandra Teretskaya, a Frederick Basiat Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And Clay Fuller, PhD adjunct professor at Western Carolina University. Having thanked our co-sponsors, the only other sort of organizational or event formality that I need to add is, in addition to thanking you all for being here, is that please, on your way out, if you have not kindly sign up on our, on our sheet, we have you on our list, that we may keep you informed of our activities going forward, particularly those efforts we undertake to facilitate advocacy outreach to representatives in Pennsylvania and at the national level. With that, I turn it over to Mitchell. Thank you very much. Okay, great. I've been um, so thanks. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks, Richard, and um, and welcome to University of Pennsylvania. Um, I am uh, been asked to uh, just say a few words about reflecting on 1989, and I think th and its legacy today. So there's of course a lot to say about 1989. A lot happened in, 19, in 1989. There were revolutions in many countries, a spiral of revolutions. Uh, that affected many people's lives, it affected my life, I think it affected all, all of our lives. And, uh, and I, but I think from today's perspective, what you see is that um, the legacy of 1989 is very tumultuous and very uh, contested. Um, and so I'll go straight to that bit of it, <laughs> which is that, you know, about 1989, there's one narrative which sort of suggests that uh, from an economic and social standpoint, that 1989 initiated sort of a, a you know democracy. It initiated a period of, of market reforms, and that after a very a pretty difficult period of um, economic recession that took place in a few years after 1989, by and large things got better in most countries and are sort of on the uptick. And we can uh, look at this period as one of unalloyed sort of good news, basically, right? The end of communism, the, the initiation of market economy. Uh, the initiation of democracy in many countries, uh, joining the European Union for many countries, and a lot of good things, in fact, have transpired since 1989. At the same time, there's a second narrative, which is also uh, very common in the world, very common in Eastern Europe, and very common uh, in Russia uh, and the former Soviet Union, which is a disaster narrative, right? That, that argues that 1989 initiated a socioeconomic collapse of epic proportions, um, that the devastating uh, economic recession, which many countries endured, uh, lasted for decades. Uh, many people suffered. Uh, many people were forced to emigrate out of these countries. Um, democracy was not established in many of these countries. Market economies were not established in many of these countries. Uh, dictatorship prevailed in many places. And as a result of these uh, you know, competing narratives, one generally pressed more by the West and by liberal institutions, and one pressed more by, by Russia and also a lot of uh, politicians and people in East Europe. Um, it, it's, it's, I, I set out with uh, a colleague, Kristen Godsey, to talk to, to do a research project we've, we've been engaged in the past couple of years on which of these narratives is right, right? It can't be that they're both right, <laughs> even though a lot of people believe in them. Um, and uh, in, interestingly, to make a very long story short, where we've written a book manuscript, we've looked at, um, a, gathered a lot of data from economic data, demographic data, which is very impactful, and we can talk more about maybe, um, but also uh, ethnographic data about how people are living their lives, and also public opinion data about how they feel about how things have gone. Um, we find that in fact, strangely, there's really, really good evidence for both of these narratives. Right? That both, at the same time, there are many people in many uh, countries, regions, cities that have done quite well out of the transition and have achieved much more than they uh, could possibly perhaps have thought uh, they would beforehand. At the same time, there are many, many places, people, and in, in fact, whole countries 
who have been devastated by what happened in 1989. And I think that story is, is more kind of striking because it's less known, particularly in the West. But there are places that have been devastated by 1989. And unfortunately, if you look at the proportions, um, in general, I would, I would say, based on all this data, approximately 30% of the people have done well, and a majority of the people, more than 60%, have not done well out of 1989. Um, so I think, the, as a result, we see a lot of political effects coming from that, that, that we find very hard to understand in the West. Why is it, for instance, that in Poland, which is considered one of the biggest success cases of liberal transformation, why is it there that we see this populist movement you know, sort of populist nationalism kind of rising against a lot of the legacies of 1999, tearing down like Valenza, for instance, who is the sort of hero of that day. It's hard to understand if you think that, you know, Poland was a unilateral success story of transition. Um, the fact is that even in Poland uh, today, uh, only 43% of Poles report that they're better off than they were in 1989. Um, and that's in one of the best case scenarios. In, in many countries, it's unassailably true, and nobody would even, you'd be laughed out of the room of saying that people are doing better now than they were in 1989. Um, so I think that, um, that we have to, um, on the 30th, an 30th anniversary of 1989, we have to really engage in a kind of critical discussion of what went right, who's done well, um, not, a, not, of course, you know, disacknowledge or, you know, the amazing things that did happen uh, in that time for a lot of people, but also the fact that things have gone very badly in the region um, for many, many people, for whole countries and certainly regions and, and, c and cities and towns in the region. Um, and, um, and I think that if one begins to understand that, that it gives us a lot more understanding of why there are these kind of political events that we're seeing, this kind of tension between kind of liberal democracy, which often seems on the back foot in the region right now, and a rise of populism um, across the region. So with that, uh, I will um, you know, uh, turn to the next panelist. I'm, I was meant to just simply give a few introductory remarks and then moderate this discussion, which I'll try to do by um, inviting the next panelist um, to speak. And um, I think maybe uh, we didn't have an order, did we? Yeah, um, so I'm just going to pick out of a hat. And I'm going to. Can you sit? Or? Yeah, you can sit. I'm going to just um, give you the, the microphone. We're going to actually dispose of the podium. And uh, I'll turn over the, uh, who, who, who would like to go first? Is anybody dying to go first? You were first on your first. Yeah, okay. Do I need that? Because I have this thing here. Oh, you have this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I um, wanted just to say right off the top of my head that I think the very fact that this organization is actively proceeding with this program and sponsored by one of the organizations that I'm familiar with, the German Orchard Fund, but also ACG and, and, and the uh, Foreign Policy Research Institute is an indication of that, despite the fact that there is a lot of, um, as we say in German, Sturm und Drang, or tension across the Atlantic, there's a great deal of activity across the Atlantic that underscores and undergirds the relationship. It's going through some changes, which I want to talk about a little bit, but I think that it's encouraging that you started this organization, and I think it's very important that you're partnering with others. And I, I tried to say that uh, transatlantic relations, in my view, German-American relations in particular, the sum is greater than its parts. And uh, I'm glad you're part of this. Let me just say that I started uh, out thinking about this uh, notion kind of along the lines that you were talking about from uh, us moving from hubris to humility. Um, when I say hubris, I think you all know what I mean, that we came out of the 89, 90 period in uh, Germany in particular with the drama of the wall coming down, with a sense that uh, we had defeated the enemy, that we had won the Cold War, and as far as Frank Fukuyama was concerned, History was over. And I think that that kind of aspect, that kind of expectation, and certainly that kind of assumption may not have worked out exactly as Frank thought it was going to work out, although he's very defensive about it these days. But I think it's important that we start with that. And that is why, and, and I, I just was saying uh, to my colleagues here, I, was, I happen to be have, have one of the people that are in the transatlantic community that was actually born in Washington, D.C. 
So I'm a big, big fan of acronyms. Uh, in Washington, we speak in acronyms all the time, and probably most people don't know what we're talking about. Uh, and um, so I want to uh, start out with, however, a number of words that all start with the letter A. The first one is accidents. Uh, those of you who will have remembered what happened in November 9 of 1989, the wall coming down was an accident. It was an accident in the sense that someone who was a spokesman for the GDR government read a statement from the then government which was scrambling on what it was supposed to do about the increasing demonstrations on that side of the wall and announced that there would now be opening, openings for people to go to West Berlin. And one of the journalists in the room said, when is that going to take place? And the guy said, I think it says in right now. In other words, right this minute. He wasn't supposed to say that. But history isn't exactly predictable. So as a result, that was the domino that then became, one year later, on October 3rd, German unification. So I think that we start out with understanding, when you understand my balance between hubris and humility, that accidents sometimes make things happen. And we don't always know where they're coming from. Uh, and also, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that the pace and the push and the uh, speed of things that happened in that particular period of time was absolutely unexpected. Yes, we've seen the demonstrations on the other side of the wall. But the collapse of the GDR and by the way, then, therefore, other things that were happening elsewhere in Europe happened in this wink of an historical eye. And that gives you also pause for understanding how we can get to know what to do when we're struggling with these unanticipated, accidental, uh, great things sometimes about history, sometimes not so great. So that's the first A. The second is actions. What do you do when you're confronted with the situation? Um, I think that one of the things that I um, happened to have the luck of the draw last night was to talk with a guy named Bob Zellick, who uh, was in the middle of this whole business trying to come to grips with what Germany uh, was about to do. And Bob Zellick and Jim Baker and George Herbert Walker Bush had the ability to respond to this in a way that I think saved us, um, maybe some bad things that could have happened because it wasn't quite clear that this was not going to happen without violence. But we had actions that were taken by a team of people in Washington, D.C. who happened to be somewhat refreshing to talk about that in current terms, but actually coordinated in talking to each other. And they managed to deal with a crisis that maybe others might not have dealt with so well. But they did it by understanding what was at stake. Germany was on its way to become united. How do you do that? How do you do that with so many moving parts around it, such as other countries who might have been concerned about it, like France and Britain? How do you deal with Russia? How do you deal with potentially helping Gorbachev, which in, in some ways he set this in motion, helping him not to be overwhelmed in his own country as this particular key was now unlocking something that they had held for 40 years? And how do you maintain a course of continuity that allowed October 3rd, 1990 to happen? By the way, think about what was going on elsewhere around the globe at that time. There was a war in Iraq. Tiananmen Square had just happened in 1989, six months before. There was a lot of pots that were boiling on the stove. But this team did what they could do to make sure that this movement happened the way it did. That's no accident, but it was certainly uh, an action that was taken that I think was a very much reflective of working together, not only in Washington, but also with our allies. The third A is assurance. How is it that we could give assurance to people that the way that Europe was going to be developing, and Germany in particular, because remember, one of the things that was at stake here 
was the so-called German question. Germany united? There were some people who thought, well, that's gonna be the Fourth Reich, or that's gonna be a real danger, or that's gonna be something that has caused us a lot of trouble in the 20th century. Um, how did you give assurance to the rest of Europe that this is going to happen in a way where a rising tide will lift all boats? And I have to say, that was a role that the United States could and did play very well in that period of time. The fourth A is alliances. Alliances are there to be used when they're necessary. They are sometimes transactional, but sometimes they're more than that. And I think that one of the things that was clear about the following years was how important that a stabilized Europe was to the United States and vice versa. The ability to have a Europe and the US on one piece of paper talking about a Europe as George Herbert Walker Bush called it, whole and free. How to work on that together. Now think about what happened in the process. NATO expands its membership. The EU becomes much larger than it was at that time. And this is happening at a point where people were saying, Europe is actually not only recovering from the Cold War divisions, but it's also becoming whole. That's something that had to happen with a certain amount of assurance to people that they were not going to be left out or that they were going to have an opportunity to be a stakeholder in this process. So assurances is part of alliances and uh, alliances are part of actions and actions are part of responding to the unanticipated or to the accidents. Number five, adjustments. What had to be adjusted along the way? We were talking about the fact that 30 years after the fall of the wall, there are questions that are perhaps a story of adjusting to uh, a larger NATO, a larger EU, a stronger Europe, um, in connection with the United States, dealing with issues that, by the way, were well beyond Europe. Remember, there was the Balkan Wars in the 90s that had to be dealt with, and of course, there was 9-11 and there was Iraq, and there were a number of other things that happened that basically underscored the fact that there had to be an adjustment on the part of Germany and Europe, Germany in particular, I think, but Europe in general, to understanding what its role would be to dealing with challenges which were far beyond the European continent. I have a favorite saying for those of you who know Germany well. During the time that the Americans were in Germany, stationed there for the 40, 50 years after World War II, there was a large number of Americans in certain parts of Germany based there. One of them was a town called Fulda. And there was something called the Fulda Gap. And the Fulda Gap was where they were anticipating that maybe Russian tanks would come across if there was ever to be a confrontation. The Fulda Gap became a metaphor for why the US was in Germany and Europe in general. Well, the argument was, ladies and gentlemen, in Germany and Europe, the Fulda gap is no longer in Fulda. It's elsewhere. So there was a certain set of adjustments about burden sharing. Who was going to do what and why? And that, by the way, we're right in the middle of at this point, as you can certainly tell by the rhetoric coming out of Washington and that out of Europe, which was mentioned at the beginning. An A for anticipation. How do you know, as far as we got to where we are now, that we are where we are or what the next change is going to be? What assumptions do we make? And that gets me back to the humility hubris thing. Because I think we sort of assumed that the history was going to be somewhat linear, but in fact, history is pretty jagged. So how do you anticipate, for example, the fact that a whole number of countries came in and became part of NATO and became the part of the EU, but then there was a great deal of dissension within the EU. For example, when one talks about Hungary or Poland or other countries that don't necessarily have the same interpretation of what it meant to become part of the EU. There's that kind of adjustment going on and the anticipation of what that's going to mean for Europe in the future. It started out by being a country, a, a, a organization that now has doubled in size, but does it have the same mission? 
Does it have the same toolbox? And if not, what do we have to anticipate to be able to make it work as it was supposed to work in the early part of its beginnings? Another A, asymmetries. You just spoke about that. Asymmetries in which the stakeholders in this massive change that went on in Europe after 1989 were not even. Now you can measure that in economic terms or you can measure it in cultural terms, but they both play a role here. What is it? Is it the economy stupid? Or is there something more to it that people feel, in some cases, that they didn't get the ride that they thought were gonna ride? So what do we do with asymmetries, which are not only economic, but are sometimes political? What is it that, where is my voice? How do I feel about what it is that I've now bought into? Did we sign up for all of these immigrants that are coming into our countries or want to? These are challenges that are symmetries that we could not <laughs> anticipate in 1989, but they're there now. And we have to deal with them and we have to anticipate probably more. A final end, ambivalence. That's what you were, I think, hinting at. Is it that Europe and the United States are headed for a division not only of burdens, but a division of missions? Do we understand that the challenges that we have to make or meet are gonna have to be made by choices that are no longer going to be in sync? What is the meaning of security sovereignty in a world in which we are all intertwined? These are issues that I think can also lead to, uh, to some extent, um, alienation, it's another A. So we're, we're at a point now, I think, where we're trying to answer four questions, um, none of which belongs, uh, start with A, but they are really four. How, when, where, and why do the two sides of the Atlantic meet each other 30 years after the wall came down? I think there are very good answers to that, and I'm sure my panelists will know what they are. But I think that they have to be reset and rethought and redigested re re and repeated and hopefully understood because I think there's a lot at stake. So that's my A's for today. You all get an A for listening today. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Ann. Um, and thanks to uh, my good friends at the US Europe Alliance um, for all the work that they're doing uh, here and in Washington and elsewhere and to FBRI and the GMF and the American Council. Um, and to you all, um, it's clear that more than half of the room was born after 1989. Um, so whether it's because you were compelled to be here by your professors or because you actually came here of your own free will, um, I'm glad that you're here and that you took the time. Um, I'm also a native Pennsylvanian, uh, so I always love to come to Philadelphia. I'm a completely rabid Philly sports fan. Still trying to figure out a way to stay for the Patriots game on Sunday. Um, <laughs> don't know if I'll make that or not, but uh, you know, one of the advantages of doing political party development work for now 25 years is that um, you get a sense of the arc um, of development and redevelopment in the political party space over time. And um, as we look around Central and Eastern Europe now, 30 years after the anniversary, yeah, can we make the... but not there, there we go, thanks. Um, and it's clear that the arc um, in Central and Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe now uh, in development of the political party sphere is not necessarily always a positive one. Um, but as we watch the arc um, and try to bend it wherever we can in places where we can, we at the International Republican Institute, IRI, um, are trying to be very careful in the way that we name problems um, so that we can, I hope, um, better devise ways to solve them. Um, so let me say at the outset that I'm going to focus mo mostly on political parties today. Um, this is in the full understanding that everyone on the planet hates political parties, not just the United States. Um, the only exception to that rule that I can find is maybe the people who work for them, um, or perhaps their parents, um, and I'm not even really completely sure of that. Um, that all being said, um, I do think we need to be really clear about the terminology that we uh, use today because some of the analysis that's being thrown around uh, in the development assistance community, particularly in the political party assistance community, is really not very specific 
uh, as we look back to what has happened since 1989. Um, and I'll start with that dreaded P word, populism, um, that has already reared its ugly head here today. Um, I think ha populism has been thrown around now as a term so often and so loosely um, that it has, in essence, lost all of its meaning uh, in uh, helping to understand what's going on in Europe and perhaps even in the United States. Um, I think you can see the term populism being applied in at least two ways that are not necessarily positive or accurate. Um, the first way is, is an epithet um, that's used by outsider parties of used by elites uh, against outsider parties of all types, um, left, right, doesn't matter where they come from, because those elite parties no longer find resonance for their messages in populations uh, at large. Emmanuel Macron in France, I think, um, by anybody's analysis, exhibits a number of populist traits. But we're all perfectly fine with Emmanuel Macron, right? We think he's progress. I think you could argue that Chancellor Merkel in Germany uh, might have had a better time of it over the years since the summer of 19, uh, 2015, um, had she perhaps been willing to take a page out of the populist playbook um, of people like Macron uh, and others uh, in Europe. Um, I think both Mark Rutte in the Netherlands, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, and Sebastian Kurz, the Chancellor of Austria, have demonstrated very clearly that you can remain among the Democrats and still tune your message in a way that is better able to meet the real needs of real people in real places uh, in those countries. The second way that the term populist gets used that I think is troublesome is as an excuse for not doing the hard grassroots work of democracy that political parties have to do and candidates have to do if they expect to win. And here I'd like to talk for just a second about Hungary um, because we all talk about it all the time. You'll know famously that uh, Viktor Orban and his party won an overwhelming victory in the April election, the last election uh, in Hungary, um, in April. Um, and I think it's fairly clear that at least in the international community, many of us were um, sort of infatuated by this upstart movement called Momentum, uh, which grew out of a civil society organization in Budapest that was originally designed to oppose the holding of the Olympics in Budapest. Um, and you know, the folks from Momentum are impressive people. Um, they're largely young, you know, there's most of them born after 1989. The men are all relentlessly bearded, um, very hip. Um, the, uh, they all speak seven languages. They all spend a lot of time in Washington and Brussels and Berlin and other capitals talking to people like us. Um, the unfortunate part was that I can tell you a story of a candidate who was running in a district just outside of Budapest, um, who two weeks before the election stayed at party headquarters in Budapest instead of going out and running and, and campaigning in his district because he had more important things to do at headquarters. So, you know, it's very difficult for me as a political party guy um, to accept the argument that somehow populism is on the march and is somehow behaving unfairly when the people that we believe are committed to democratic ideals in an opposition don't do the hard work necessary to go out and get themselves elected. That's a problem. Another challenge, I think, is how we categorize authoritarian popul or populist parties and governments. There's a great deal of pressure around Washington these days, for example, uh, to put Poland under PIS, um, Hungary under Fidesz, uh, Serbia under Vucic, uh, and uh, Turkey under Erdogan in the same big basket. But I'd be willing to, get, to guarantee you that poor categorization of the problem will inevitably lead to poor solutions to the problem uh, if we go down that path. And for all its faults, uh, and there are many, PIS in Poland simply is not comparable to Erdogan's AKP in Turkey. Um, Jack, you mentioned Frank Fukuyama. Um, I think the fact is, is that if we're honest, um, we were incredibly naive back in the early 1990s. Um, or at least I was incredibly naive about what could be done. We all believed that it would inevitably be the case that a sort of German model for political party systems would obtain across the region. That every country would have sort of a big center-right party, a big center-left party, um, probably a liberal party to take care of the interests of entrepreneurs and business people, and then probably a green party, uh, you know, that would be at something like 10% in the polls. Um, now that model doesn't even apply to Germany anymore. 
Um, and you can see clearly in the results of the elections in Thuringia just two weeks ago, uh, so one of the states in the former East Germany, which I think is you know, sort of one of the model spaces for your analysis um, of the people who felt that they were left behind. Um, the extreme left party placed first and the extreme right party placed second, pushing a mainstream party you know, to the third position in the polls. So um, if I can dare to quote Vladimir Ilyich, um, what is to be done? Um, three things, I think, generally speaking. Uh, first, we have to work to address the weaknesses in the traditional mainline center-right and center-left parties um, to enable them to remain competitive. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative American Republican, um, but my biggest concern across Europe these days is the collapse of the center-left. Right? The traditional parties that have represented working people on the center-left, social, demo de social democracy, broadly speaking, are in full-fledged collapse across the continent. The French Socialist Party, one of the, if I can use the term, vanguard um, of the left uh, and social democracy in Europe, is essentially gone. It doesn't exist anymore. German social democracy uh, will per per perhaps be gone in another election cycle or two. Um, this is a problem, uh, and it leaves open uh, a broad swath of the electorate um, to messages that come from the extremes of both left and right. It is in part why we got the vote that, we, that obtained in the UK for Brexit in the north of England. Um, it's why we get the kind of electoral results we get in East Germany and in the formerly industrial parts of East Germany. Uh, and we see similar things elsewhere across uh, the continent. Um, second, I think we need to work with startup parties, emerging parties, new parties to help shape their development. Um, not every emerging party or startup party or pop-up party, they're called many different things, um, is necessarily destructively populist. Uh, so we are expending a lot of energy to establish contacts with the plethora of new parties across Europe um, to get them engaged in our, in our ongoing work because we have found time and time again that many of them don't come into the political sphere with a Rolodex in the United States. Many of them haven't gone through the traditional visitors programs to the United States. Many of them didn't study in the United States or travel in the United States. And if we're going to maintain the kind of transatlantic relationship that I think we're all committed to, right, we need to be able to identify young political leaders before they go into the political systems um, and establish uh, connections uh, with the United States. Um, third, um, I think we need to work, continue to work with problem parties to keep lines of communication or influence open. Not every party, no party in any country, in Europe at least, is a monolith. Um, Fides, PIS, the FPR in Austria, Baba Shizano in the Czech Republic, the SDS in Slovenia, all of these are parties that have various wings um, that are more or less comfortable with the leadership of the party at a given moment. Um, so I think we have to work and keep talking with um, all of the wings of the various parties that we deal with because in some cases they can, individuals and groups inside parties, wings and parties can be salamied off from the mothership um, and perhaps take uh, the political system in a different direction. Um, last um, but not least, I think um, we need to keep our eye on the ball on the sort of long trends, the arc that I talked about at the beginning. Um, and on that, maybe just a couple of thoughts. I think it's fairly clear that we're seeing a restructuring of the EU party families um, uh, at the EU level and in the nation states across Europe um, in the wake of the May 2019 European Parliament elections, um, uh, which has a lot to do with how the party structures are responding to populist uh, influence. Um, the center right and center left no longer dominate the core of decision making at uh, the EU level, that's an issue for the United States. That's an issue in the transatlantic relationship because that's where most of our contacts historically have been. Um, we need now uh, to come up with a much more uh, sophisticated approach um, that brings in um, parts of parties which appear to perhaps um, have um, an anti-American or an anti-transatlantic agenda. Um, but try to bring them more on board. And it's frankly a much more complicated beast for us all to manage. Um, and you see that expressed, for example, this past week in uh, French President Macron's statement on, statement on NATO. Uh, 
Um, you know, there is a history for that. There's a Gaullist history in France. Let's remember that NATO started in Paris. It's not in Paris anymore. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, but all of these sort of trends are coming back to the surface in a way that is going to make it more complicated for the U.S. to respond. And within all of that, I think we have to keep our eye on the, on the fact that there are external forces, whether it's the Russian Federation or the Chinese Communist Party and the state that it owns, um, or other actors um, who have an interest in destabilizing political systems nationally in Europe and at the EU and NATO level as well. Um, they are investing very heavily into political parties across the region uh, in order to be able to create the kind of disorder from which they can benefit. So um, I'll wrap up with that. I think we just need to be very careful in the way we define our terms um, so that everything we do doesn't devolve into complaining about populism. Um, you know, the fact is that for many people uh, in the new democracies in Central and Eastern Europe, life is not better. And um, that's, that's documentable in your research um, and, in, and in many other ways. And uh, if we don't, I think, address those underlying challenges and those underlying needs that come from 1989, but also from the economic crisis in 2008, 2009, still, um, we will not be able to find a solution that keeps us all together as an alliance. Thanks very much. Alexandra, I think I'll yeah. go to you next. Your microphone, I trust. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, it's an honor for me to particip participate in this panel discussion and actually to bring in this case study, case study Belarus. Belarus is a country where I was born and raised. Uh, Belarus was uh, one of the part of these transformative forces. So if to look back at those events, and I will talk more like with details just to show you, uh, to a little bit show you how it happened, how Belarus uh, used or why Belarus didn't use this transformative force of change, um, and go into a little bit of historical details and what's, uh, what's in Belarus, um, what's the situation in Belarus right now. So Berlin Wall was a, pow uh, a, a power symbol, and it was a dividing line between the values of communism and Western democracies. When collapse uh, of Soviet Union uh, happened in 1991, it gave a lot of expectations for the Eastern European countries uh, that there will be uh, a new world, a world with uh, democracies, flourishing markets of ideas and economies. And it was one of the expectations that Belarusian people had at that moment, or some of them. Also, people feared um, uncertainties at that time because they woke up essentially a non-existing country without identity or any clear vision for future. This change was celebrated. And the beginning of transformation was, was powerful and was led by necessity to build identity of the nation, political course, and plan for development of the economy. The question arose also about affiliations. And all these items were on agendas of political forces that existed at that time. And these forces, I would say, were like two-sided. So one, um, one vision was about, which was led by a popular front in Belarus and Zenon Kozniak, as well as a cultural activist and pro-European um, pro communist dissidents. They envisioned Belarus with a strong identity based on historic tradition that goes back to 17th century. They promoted uh, uh, this necessity for identity was essentially promoted by uh, intellectuals and institutions that believe that Belarus is its own state, not Russian state. Another, another, another force was formed by people who were nostalgic about Soviet Union and essentially saw themselves as their people who need to maintain this heritage. It's this heritage uh, re uh, related to economics as well as a like, political vision. 
political vision of brotherhood with Russia and association with values. At that moment, if we look at data, like if we look how people voted, it showed that m most of Belarusians believed in believed that the system they lived before was reliable. Because in uh, 1990, uh, when elections happened, uh, Belarusian Front, the front that led this identity movement for Belarus, got only 8% in the parliament. They formed a minority, and this minority couldn't bend the, the way of um, uh, like nostalgia, uh, the way of people who are uh, who were nostalgic about uh, uh, about Soviet Union, and uh, in 1994, when the current president current president ran for the elections, uh, they couldn't bend this trend of unification with Russia. Because uh, starting from 1994 until now, Belarus has this course of unification and association with, um, with, with, with Russia. It's remarkable that after winning the elections, current president, uh, General Lukashenko, also initiated referendum. And the main points of this referendum and change that happened were related to identity part. Symbols uh, were changed. Sim those symbols, which more look like a Soviet Union, a Soviet era symbol, as well as Russian language, gained status of constitutional language. I will emphasize at uh, at the moment of, I would say, independence. The uh, Belarusian language was the only one state language. <coughs> but as um, as only uh, this pro, uh, pro, I would say, pro nostalgic forces uh, towards uh, towards uh, um, Russia um, started. Uh, uh, Russian language was uh, w w became a uh, second Belarusian uh, s second state language in Belarus. Since then, until now, Belarus ascended to authoritarian status um, through political reforms, manipulated elections, central planned uh, economy, zealous supervision of media outlets, and tight control of particularly every, every facet of daily life in Belarus. For this, people paid a harsh price because economy declines as well as standards of living declines. And in general, society lost, if you look like, lost 20 years of opportunities for development and growth. If you look and research Belarus, you always will see two main trends that define Belarus. Belarus is pro-Russia, pro Belarus is pro-European Union. And this is a question that, that is still a question for many Belarusian people and for many, uh, uh, and for our neighbors. And um, if you look at geography of Belarus, it's centered. It has both sides. From one side is Russia. From another side, we have Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Ukraine. So uh, Belarus is at, at, at the crossroads geographically and also politically. Current regime is sitting, is sitting on two chairs. It's, and uh, these two chairs is like pro-Russia and pro-Russia, which is actionable. And I would say pro-Europe, which is more token. And um, because uh, in legal terms, Belarus is a, uh, is a part of Eastern Partnership since 2009. And also Belarus is a participant of uh, economic Euro uh, Eurasian Union. However, at this point, after years of, um, after years of uh, unification with Russia, there is a clear question uh, which Belarus cannot refuse to answer. Which part? Uh, in, in, in which union Belarus will take part. 
And all, although Bel uh, Belarusian regime is focused on its strengthening its power, I think that people give answer where Belarus wants and need to be. And these are young voices. It's voices of young people who, who I would say consider themselves as Europhiles. Uh, uh, people who see themselves, uh, their future with, with Europe. People who affiliate themselves with, with values, with European uh, values, values of democracy, free society, as well as a innovative and of, of all the economic potential that brings um, liberal markets. Today we discussed Today we discuss the history, and uh, it also was mentioned that there were there were certain elements. Uh, there were uh, there were two A's, which played role in forming the transformation: uh, action and assurance. Action and assurance is what uh, Belarusian youth. Pro uh, European voices are needed now. And uh, action and assurance can come both from, Euro uh, from European uh, politicians and from United States as an alliance. Assurance that Belarus is a part of a uh, European family and uh, that Belarus can extend the geography of European values. Values of human rights values of demo democra uh, democratic systems, values of liberal markets. At this point, I would say there are like mixed feeling about like how much is done towards Belarusian, uh, Belarusian, uh, the Belarusian society. Because uh, Eastern neighbor is certain what shall be done with Belarus. Nobody has doubts about it. But our Western neighbors, I would say, uh, may take a stronger action on emphasis that uh, Belarus can be a part of, of, of Europe, that Belarus is, uh, can bring a valuable example to other countries that transformation may happen. And the, that, that in a historical inheritance of the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall can have actionable transition. Well, I had one follow-up question, Alexandra. Um, the, uh, <coughs> I'd meant to, to ask a follow-up to the other people as well, and I'll, but I'll get back to that in a second. But I do have a follow-up for you, which is, if you, thinking again back to the sort of socioeconomic issues that I was talking about earlier, would you say that an average um, Belarusian voter or citizen in Belarus feels that, um, that by missing out on a lot of the market reforms, not all market reforms, but to the extent that, were, that happened in neighboring countries, that Belarus gained or lost? Um, um, because I, th I think you'd agree that Belarus, although it did transform its economy a little bit, did so because it was authoritarian rule somewhat less than some of its neighbors. Is that, is that correct? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I would say just looking at uh, how people live their lives and um, at the habits that they employ, we see that people regret it. Uh, at certain point of time, uh, Polish embassy made restrictions on the amount of visa that can be issued. And this is, was a response to uh, to people's like behavioralistic part to people behavior because many people from the neighboring regions with Poland just traveled to Poland to this Polish small cities on the on the border to purchase simple goods like like soap like uh, like other necessary items for the households because it was more affordable to travel to Poland, it's afford more affordable to travel to Poland or Lithuania to get these goods. Of course, people see the difference, and of course, people understand that though there is no wall, there is 
uh, there is a distinction between the two, uh, between the countries or neighboring countries of European Union and Belarus. And um, people, uh, people, people want change because, as we understand, these basic needs of um, ba ba basic needs of um, having, uh, I would say, having um, decent power protect is a driving force for political choices. But these political choices in Belarus is hard to make, uh, hard to make because there is. Um, there is a threat to be, uh, uh, there is a threat posed by, by government of being detained, of being imprisoned, of losing a job. Uh, so of course people uh, choose the least, uh, the course of least resistance. And um, believing, I would say, in a better future, they also expect that there will be uh, that there will be such circumstances they, uh, when they can make this choice. And circumstances will be when you have a strong leaders, strong leaders, because right now Belarus is in a position in a very weak position, uh, who, will, who will lead this change, who will continue to lead this change, because transformation is, is ongoing process. It's hard, it's, uh, it will be wrong to say that now Belarus is a authoritarian state and that you cannot do anything with that. It's not true. Generation change. And the vision about Belarusian future change. And uh, those generations, they don't know Soviet Union. What they know, they, they know how, uh, how people live in, in Europe and they see how people live in Russia. And this, I would say, gaps that exist between will and action can be filled. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> With that, we'll turn to uh, Clay. Um, and um, yeah, please take so, it away. So now for something completely, totally different. Um, so my name is Clay Fuller. I, I have did mention that there were discombobulated sense of 1989 that you're getting very clearly here, I think. Yes. Um, but I identify myself as an empirically oriented institutionalist. So essentially what I do is I go around and I count the number of years rules. Am I working? Yeah. Okay. So I identify myself as an empirically oriented institutionalist where I count rules and things and, and plug them into statistical programs, statistical uh, uh, modeling in order to get a better understanding um, about, about the world. If, um, for the millennials in the room, if I had a pronoun, it would probably be jerk, uh, because that's what most people call me, because I tend to just say things the, the way that they, they are. But, so what I've been doing for the past two years, I really love what uh, Rich and Scott are doing with the US-Europe Alliance, because I think this is the exact approach that's needed in a strategy in new great power competition uh, in, in the world. Um, we need to be reaching outside of the beltway to other to universities and to real Americans out there who need to hear about what's going on uh, with the relationship between the United States and, and Europe. And the way I come to this is that I spent six years at the University of South Carolina writing my dissertation on authoritarian rule and in institutions and thinking about all this. And I came, my first job was in the Beltway at the American Enterprise Institute as the Gene Kirkpatrick Fellow um, in Foreign and Defense Policy Studies. And this was my first break into anything outside of teaching for the past six, seven years, which I've still been doing. You see with my adjunct, uh, adjunct my token adjunct position. Um, at a great university, by the way, Western Carolina University. Um, but I came to, to, to the American Enterprise Institute and they said, do whatever you want. And so what I ended up doing was looking around at what foreign policy was going on and where my research was relevant. So what was my research? Uh, my dissertation was the economic foundations of authoritarian rule. 
So this is looking, I've been teaching a course on modern 21st century dictatorships for the past five years. And what I'd done is I'd collected original data on the personality types of every single modern dictator post-Cold War, post-1989. And then I had collected original data on special economic zones and sovereign wealth funds, which are essentially economic policies, domestic economic policies that connect into liberal Western markets. And what I did was I ran duration analysis modeling on this data in order to see what was the best predictor of how long a dictator would survive in office and how long a modern dictatorship would survive in the post-Cold War era. And what I found was the best predictor of how long a modern dictator will survive is how much money he embezzles while in office, right? And then for the regime, the best predictor was to what extent did they connect into Western liberal markets, right? So it makes base validity sense, um, but then how do you turn that into policy and how do, you, how do you look at that? And so that's what I puzzled over for a long time and I ended up writing this report that's called Dismantling the Authoritarian Corruption Nexus. And I put this huge pile of four million boulevards on the front of it, uh, just as a, and a, and a chicken, you know, like, because that's how much a chicken cost at that time due to hyperinflation in, in Venezuela. But the report wasn't about Venezuela. The report was about how we come to understand great power competition post-1989, right? How do we look at this? Is it a new Cold War? This is what I kept hearing all the time, people asking me, is it a new Cold War? How do, we, how do we strategize against this? What, what, do we, what do we do? And the way that I came down to really look at it is that what's going on is, is great power competition, but it's not a Cold War. It's not as ideological as the Cold War was. It's more about the nuts and bolts of basic governance. It's more about how we govern our markets, how we govern our politics, how we govern our media, how we set the rules, right? The institutions, being, in, being an institutionalist, right? So I came up with the, basically, if I had to sum it up in a sentence, I said, we, we need to do is we need to conserve liberty where it exists and prepare for the future, right? Is how we win this round of great power competition. And so, the best way to sort of frame this is that it's, and, and this is where I'm sort of the outsider on the panel because I'm not a Europeanist, I'll just say that um, very clearly. I study only non-democratic regimes around, around the world. But so it's a competition between freedom and authoritarianism. Like very, very simply. But we don't have this like, this, the same communist USSR thread running through everything to help us organize our thinking about how. So this is how I come to the US-Europe alliance because in thinking in the world about this and looking at it and understanding that these authoritarian regimes have this institutional thread that looks different ideologically uh, across, across the board. Democracies have this institutional thread that looks different on the surface but is the same institutions across the board. This is how you conserve liberty and grow it out in order to win this, this round of great, great power competition. So this is sort of how we get into that and, and, and win um, that fight. Now, so the pushback I get all the time is like, well, corruption is everywhere and corruption is rising and corruption you know, is, this, is, is this terrible thing. And I'm like, yes, everybody hates cor corruption. There's nobody out there. Uh, saying we need more corruption, uh, right? But so again, I turn to the data and the evidence, right? So if you look at any data set on corruption, any data set on democracy and authoritarianism, authoritarian regimes are on average way more corrupt than democratic regimes all around the world ever are. This is the institute, this is a reflection of the institutional thread that I'm talking about that runs through three countries all around the world and the, the one that runs through authorita authoritarian ones around there. But we have to wrap our heads around sort of how we're going to, to understand that. And that's not an easy process, and it's not, it's not gonna come easy at all, but it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna take sort of talking to everybody and having a running conversation about sort of how this works. So, so we're having a discussion in the United States about corruption right now. Um, there's one going on uh, in Brazil, there's one going on in every democracy that you can imagine. You know why that is, is because democracies have a free press, right? So you actually hear about it. 
we actually talk about it. So, so when we talk about corruption in, demo in democratic countries, I'm actually heartened by that. I actually look at it and say, great, we're having a conversation about it. Because after 12 years of studying today's dictatorships in depth, nobody talks about it there. But it's way, way, way worse, but they don't have a free press to bring it out, discuss it. They don't have the institutions to debate it in open forum or to, to, to work this out through a rules-based uh, uh, system. So what that means is that this is why all the literature and the evidence will also show authoritarian regimes are very fragile. They tend to collapse out of nowhere because they don't have these, these open discussions about things like corruption. So you tend to have violent collapses, you tend to have wars, you tend to have uh, uh, countries that have the, the worst outcomes, human rights violations that you, can, that you can possibly imagine. So essentially, I see what this, what's going on here with the US-Europe uh, uh, alliance is essentially this is how we push for good governance and democracy around the world is by drawing in closer and tighter to the other countries that share this institutional thread, and that's Europe. It's not just Europe, it's, it's Britain, it's Canada, it's uh, Australia, it's New Zealand, it's Japan, it's India, and then there's a whole middling range of countries that are getting closer and closer to democracy where we could invest heavier in helping them come on to the US-Europe alliance so that we can win this great power competition and bring Francis Fukuyama's dream to the fore. I mean, I, I, I think he was very optimistic and maybe early for his time, but I do think that there is a sort of inevitability that's probably not gonna be in my lifetime, I'll be real, realistic about it, but it's, it's going to happen. And so we should actually, I mean, you, you see it in Hong Kong right now, you see it in Lebanon, um, you see it in Bolivia, you see it in Chile, you see people are excited, people know this, they, they see it, and this is, we're talking about uh, uh, 1989, a shadow without the wall, what we're seeing is 30 years later, so what I said at the beginning, I was 10 years old when the wall fell, right, my son right now is 10 years old. Right, so I see this coming full circle. We are right in that same area. And so the, the, real, the real sort of question is, is that now that we're on this sort of precipice, are we prepared to support our allies and our friends around the world that are crying for, the, for, this, for this same type of, type of change? And I think that's the real question. And that's, I think, what US-Europe Alliance represents just by existing, and that's why it needs to be strengthened. But this is also what we all should be doing, is going around and talking about this more with our families, with our friends, on social media, in other places, to explain to everybody how, how, how this is the important core backbone that is going to bring freedom and liberty to the rest of the world. Okay, great. I have a couple maybe follow-up questions on that. Um, that was an interesting presentation. I, I, I'm, I, I get the political science part of it. That makes a lot of sense to me, uh, being a political scientist myself. Um, I have a question, though. I mean, two, really two questions that come to mind. One is, um, I, I like the, your, your idea that, you know, there's a sort of meta sort of um, conflict taking place in the international sphere between forces, you could say, of freedom, very broadly cast, I mean, I guess political freedom and economic freedom being two parts of that, and then forces of more authoritarianism. And you note that the uh, freedom side seems to be losing right now, right? And, and the thing is that I didn't get from your research is why is that, right? So, so you, you told me that the authoritarian countries tend to be more corrupt, and also that people don't like corruption. So why are they winning? <laughs> like, it doesn't give me any, any understanding of like, why we're on our back foot right now. And is it because that, um, you know, anyway, there could be a million explanations for that. But the other question I have so glad for you, you asked. Yeah, the other question for you is, um, you know, specifically with regard to this region, this region is a little unusual, the, the post-communist region, because in this region of the world, you've seen with the progress from authoritarianism to freedom, you've seen actually an increase in economic inequality, which I talked about before vast increase in economic inequality. And you've seen a vast increase in corruption. 
which again, a little bit goes, goes against, and not that your story's wrong, but it, in this part of the world, to the extent that they made that transition, they had a huge increase in corruption when they moved from the world of authoritarianism to the world of freedom. So how do you, how do you understand that? Right, so those are great questions um, and perfect. So the way that I see it is that actually democracy is not on its back foot. Really, so so it, it 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 depends really. So it gets on the definitional stuff, like Jan, Jan was talking about these concepts, understanding them. What, how we've come to understand democracy has sort of changed, and what that has done is, and that changed with 1989, right? Um, but that's changed the way that we measure it and understand it. So this narrative of democratic decline is based upon the measures that we use to measure democracy, based upon how we understood it pre and around 1989, but we haven't changed those definitions since then. So what's happened since the fall of the Berlin Wall is that every country around the world now holds elections. I mean, North Korea holds elections every five years, and there's only one person on the ballot, but they hold the elections. <laughs> um, every, every country around the world does that, and this is unprecedented in world history, and people don't write about it very much or talk about it because everybody sort of understands that in some countries they're rigged or, or slanted, and they are. There's a great book called Competitive Authoritarianism by Lucan uh, uh, Way and Steve Levitsky that uh, I suggest on this topic. But what, if you look at some data sets that look more at the electoral side of it, they will count democracy, and it shows that democracy has been booming and that it's, it's been doing great for the past 13 years. If you look at places like Freedom House that measures civil rights and political rights, which are less sort of institutional and more sort of norms-based, you see a steep decline over the past 13 years. Um, you look at like the Polity Project, uh, right, and you see a steep increase in democracies over the, over the past 30 years. And you look at some other data sets and you'll see, you'll see a decline. So there's something weird going, going on there. And so, uh, so I don't wanna like unequivocally say that democracy's on the march and it's spreading, but it depends on what data set you're looking at really, which depends upon how you're defining democracy. Is it more electoral based or is it more norms and, and, and rights based? So I see that the way, the way I've come to see that personally is, is that this, you know, if, if, you, if you take the democracy is spreading through elections, right, that's a huge strategic advantage and a, a, a massive, awesome positive for the 21st century because even though we might have all these things that we talk about like populism or vo the vote rigging that does happen and the vote buying and, and lack of transparency and all the problems that happen with it, their infrastructure is there. Like there have been people working really hard since the Berlin Wall fell to teach all these countries how elections work. And so even though they're imperfect, they still, it's become normalized, right? It's kind of like the, the, spread, the spread of norms, like with uh, women voting, right? It happened really fast and it spread just because everybody sort of understood, oh, this is right, right? Well, the same thing sort of happened with elections and now it's there. And so now it's just about sort of the rest of it, right? Like sort of teaching that oh, well, you should have, you know, free and fair debates, right? You should have observers. You should have all these other things that come along, a free press, right? Individual property rights, uh, independent, impartial rule of law in courts, you know, all these types of things. It, so the, the, but the elections are there. So that's what makes me very, very hopeful and, and positive about the spread of democracy. Now, with the question of inequality, yes, uh, absolutely, that's, that's a question all over the world. It's a question here in the United States, uh, uh, and a very, very impactful and important one. But again, it comes down to sort of the, the perceptions of it, right? So in a communist state, like, you don't know that you're unequal. unequal. Uh, so like in, in China, right, the, the communist party members are fabulously wealthy. Right, but the, but the poor Chinese don't know that because they don't publish accurate statistics. There, there's no Forbes magazine listing the 500 top net worth Communist Party members in, in, in China. So there's no way for the average Chinese citizen to sort of understand and internalize what economic inequality feels like. Whereas here in the United States or in Western countries or in post-communist states, where now they have these free presses and, and more open discussion about these things, right? They, they get to recognize that and they understand it and it creates real problems, right? But you know, the institutions of democracy, the liberation, free press, regularized turnover of leaders and legislatures or parliaments or voting, 
right? These are the things that are designed to mitigate the effects of economic inequality, and we see that happen from election cycle to election. So that's where I feel hopeful about it, right? I think there are problems, but I, I feel hopeful. You know, um, uh, if I could turn, turn over to Jan right now, because I could see a lot of what, what uh, Clay was saying really directly affects something of your expertise, which is elections and voting, right, and also party building. And just for those of you who don't know about IRI, I mean, a lot of what they do is, is supporting democratic institutions through kind of basically institution building programs, you know, to parties across the spectrum, as far as I understand that, uh, and, and also to Congresses and parliaments and this sort of thing. So, um, so when you hear this claim that if you have elections, that should make us all really super optimistic, even if they're elections like the Belarus one, for, I'll just pick on Belarus for a second, where after 2010 election, you know, the thugs came out and beat everybody up and then threw the, all the presidential candidates in jail, that we should be enthusiastic about that because it's at least opening the possibility of, you know, a future election. I'm not enthusiastic about that. <laughs> well, you <laughs> so said you just, were. You just said to you clarify. <laughs> I mean, that, that we should still be enthusiastic about that because it opens the possibility of some future, you know, fairer election. What's your perspective from inside the region? You've been there for, you know, we're working on the ground for 25 years. I mean, what do you see about that, the importance of electoral versus substantive matters in democracy? Uh, thanks for the question. So a couple of things. Um, I mean, I, I fully agree with Clay's point that there is value in process, right? Um, I mean, we can disagree with the results of any given election um, in the United States or in the older democracies uh, around the world. Um, but there is, uh, I think, uh, inherent value in shaping the way people view the functioning of democracy um, with the idea that at some point I'm gonna get a chance to express my opinion on what's going on in this society. Right, so there is there is innate value in that, and I think that's the point that Clay is trying to make. And by that standard, I agree completely that democracy, you know, is in essence on the march, right? And I think you know there's another way to look at that as well. If we look at Armenia, um, or if we look at what has been happening, for example, in Moldova until just yesterday or the day before, um, or even in some of the demonstration movements that we've seen in Romania or the Czech Republic or Slovakia. Um, we have systems in, in, in many of these places where people have a mechanism to be able to express themselves either on election day or, uh, or outside that time frame uh, in the street in the form of public demonstration. And that is value. And we didn't have that in the communist regimes in Central and Eastern Europe before the wall fell, right? Um, uh, uh, so there are lots of ways these days for people to express their democratic points of view that we never had before. There's also the whole realm of social media, which we haven't talked about much here today because it was a non-factor in 1989, right? And now it's really a defining factor um, in engaging people in the system uh, and therefore in the democratic process. So, you know, we at IRI and my good friends over at NDI, because I think we look at these things mostly the same, are big proponents of process. Right, process matters. I do want to take, if I can, on a slightly different question, take issue with the idea that, that somehow uh, there is less, there is more corruption in the new democracies now than there was under the communist governments. Communist governments that, that dominated the region before 1989 were fundamentally corrupt. They were corrupt at the most possible core level. Um, uh, the people who uh, entered the party and served the party got the benefit. People who didn't enter the party and serve the party did not get economic benefit. And when everybody is equally poor, um, you know, uh, except for the people who run the political system, to me, that is the most possible, the most, the clearest possible expression of corruption. Um, uh, and, and, and with that, I'll go back to Clay's point that, um, again, you know, the systems that we have that have emerged in, like, since 1989 across the region are imperfect systems. They are imperfect democracies just like our own. Um, yes, it is absolutely true that political officials at all levels, state, federal, national, steal. No question about that. But there's also not a place across the region, even in the countries that we are most concerned about, Poland, Hungary, others, where there aren't people who are talking about that. And part of the process here, you know, I can remember very clearly um, one of the things I learned about how people looked at the United States after the, after the fall of the wall in 1989, um, when you were talking to people who had grown up in the communist governments, communist regimes, they were fascinated by 
the Watergate hearings, right? Because it was inconceivable that there could be a public airing of corruption at the various high, very highest levels of politics, right? And in every country I can think of now, um, in the new member states, maybe with a couple of exceptions, um, that is near possible or is absolutely possible. And that, that is, that's progress and it's progress for democracy. So I'm, you know, I'm, I, maybe I get paid to be an optimist for democracy because it's, you know, what we like to sell. Um, but if you look at, I mentioned Armenia, um, you look at the Maldives, you look at so many places around the world. Uh, Hong Kong, I was just in Berlin last week with a group of people from Hong Kong and Venezuela. And they are fighting the fight right now and living it every day and they're doing it because they understand that the kind of world they want to grow up in, which is mostly young people, uh, is more like ours than it is like the model that Beijing is exporting. Um, so I think time is on our side. Okay, great. I'm feeling much more optimistic and I'm realizing that I need to look at totally different data uh, <laughs> most days. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think I'd like to turn it over for audience questions. Um, so. Uh, you know, does anybody have a question or a comment? Okay, I, I know that there's some questions. Hi, uh, Matthew Kwasiborski with the Fund for American Studies. Hi, Jan, good to see you. Uh, a couple of questions. One, I guess Jan, uh, IRI did a lot of work in Ukraine uh, after the revolution. Was the election of President Zelensky, how dominant it was, a surprise to IRI, considering how much work uh, you guys have done outside of the major cities in developing democracy? And I guess another question for Clay, great uh, presentation, is what do you think is the key to keep the U.S.-Europe alliance going? Uh, where do you see there, maybe in terms of NATO? Uh, we also heard what President Macron said last week in The Economist. Was he playing to the populist rhetoric of the French to keep his base? Or he's also played a lot up to the Russians as well. And for the general uh, panel, what's happened in the Czech Republic, I think, in the last couple of days has been quite interesting. And let's say the last couple of months, how they fought back against uh, the Russian influence, removing the statue of the general who liberated the Czechoslovakia, but then was a part of the spring invasion of 1968. But then the scandal, what's happening at Charles University and uh, the, the Czech Communist Party, in the sense of, I think the Czechs are realizing that uh, all the investments the Chinese have made are not, are just real estate based, they're not bringing any business. So I guess there's a lot of questions for you guys, but please feel free, thank you. Hi, um, so I had a question for you. I don't know, I forgot your name, sorry. Yeah, you. Uh, you spoke earlier about um, like how your organization, like uh, you spoke earlier about how um, you find fault with like a lot of the parties that have maintained power in Europe. They've kind of fallen behind of what people want in terms of they don't reach out to people anymore, they don't engage with people. Do you see that as a larger problem than the policies of those parties? Like the type of economic policies that they have pursued that might, that have left people behind. And so like the grassroots organizing isn't as important as the actual policies that they engage in. And so even if they could communicate better with people, um, like those center right or center left policies, uh, kind of parties that dominated European politics haven't been able to keep up with kind of globalization or some of those kind of effects that people feel and the economic policies are just not reaching them. Okay, so I'll let the panelists answer these questions. I think there is a question over there. Um, on NATO, yes, awesome. Uh, more NATO, please. Uh, there are, of course, problems. Like these liberal international institutions always have problems. One of the problems is that they're oftentimes too inclusive, uh, right? That they don't include a mechanism for expulsion for bad behavior. So if you look at my AEI report, one of them there, one of the recommendations there is to formalize the group of seven, because I do think it's always the economy, stupid. Um, <laughs> you know, they, and looking at the G7, they were, came together in 1989 in order to deal with issues surrounding the oil crisis and other economic issues for dealing with the communist states. 
um, right? But then they expanded the G8 and then haphazardly kicked Russia out. But it's not a formal institution. There's no secretariat. There's no, there's no anything. It's just an informal gathering. Um, but right now with the seven countries that we have in there, these are established, strong, long-lasting democracies that have shared interests, right? And so what I suggested in that report is that they should formalize the group and they should uh, create a process for ascension and a process, importantly, for expulsion if doing peer reviews of each other for that. The other, the other place that I suggest in there, which I know is problematic, it can be, but, but you can look to the Financial Action Task Force, which was created by the G7 in 1989 to deal with international money laundering, um, right, in order to look for ways to cooperate on this. And there's precedent for this because FATF was used heavily post 9-11 in order to enforce <coughs> counter financing of terrorist uh, uh, laws. And it's been wildly successful by every way that everybody has uh, looked at it so far. Um, and so that there's a model there for sort of building this out. But it's, it's more cooperation among democracies. And you can look to John McCain uh, proposed this last time he ran for president, where he proposed a League of Democracies. And this is sort of the, it, this has been proposed over and over and over in American politics and European politics for a while. Now in some iteration, a community of democracies exists uh, today um, that's, that's there, but a small group of committed, established, strong democracies in the world can have effects that, that would be greater than anything we've ever seen before. Uh, why don't you let Jan respond and then I'll have one last one comment. Good scream. Um, let's see, a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, the Czech Republic um, as sort of an example of the evolving uh, engagement of China uh, in the region. Um, you know, uh, this is one of those politics makes strange bedfellows sort of a thing, right? Um, we, uh, we at IRI, and I, just to, to stay in Prague for two seconds, we at IRI, uh, to the best of my knowledge, have never had any discourse at all with the pirate parties that have emerged around the region, right? Um, and yet, um, one, of the, one of our biggest allies on exposing uh, the corruption that is brought in the economic relationship with the current Chinese government is the pirate party, Lord Mayor of Prague, Right, who is perfectly willing uh, to call out um, the, the negative impact um, of Chinese investment uh, in the Czech Republic because it is fundamentally corrosive um, with regard to corruption and therefore with regard to the, the public's confidence in the democratic system. Right? And we see people like that all over the region who, um, you know, engagement with, uh, with Beijing is new for most of the countries that we're talking about. Um, you know, there has not been much discourse historically. Everybody's very aware of the behavior of Moscow and they feel there's something, they're somewhat insulated against it, but the relationship with China is new and different and therefore um, there's a learning curve that, that is uh, 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 being accomplished. And I think in the end, you know, if you look at what China has done in places like the Czech Republic, Greece, Macedonia, if you wanna see um, how Chinese investment works out, take a drive from Struga in North Macedonia to Tirana, Albania, where you will parallel mile after mile after mile of completely unfinished highway um, on which something like a billion dollars of Chinese investment disappeared because Chinese financial engagement in the countries we're talking about is almost always corrosive on the question of corruption and democracy. Um, Ukraine, um, I, 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 I'm not the Ukraine guy at IRI, so I will leave that to my colleagues uh, who work Ukraine, but I think it was very clear going up to the election, um, first of all, on the question whether there was going to be an early election, um, and second of all, with regard to public confidence in the, in the then government, that people were still dissatisfied and that the promises of the Maidan had not been fulfilled. Um, they were probably never going to be fully met um, no democratic government can be expected to do that. But I think the great message of Ukraine is that Ukraine has now had five straight elections going in where we didn't know who was going to win. Try that in Moscow. Try that in Minsk, right? That's why, that's why Ukraine is so fantastically, desperately important to what we're trying to accomplish because it is a message to real people in places like the Russian Federation that it actually can be different. Um, on the parties in Europe, uh, it's, so it's a feedback loop, 
right? Is it, if you, if you talk to mainstream political parties who are failing now, very often they will come back, and it's a great question, by the way, um, they will come back to you and say, well, we just need to communicate better. We need to tell our story better, right? The minute you hear that, you know there's a problem, right? Because if you were actually telling, if you had something to tell, people would be hearing the story. And, and you're right, many of the economic policies that have been at the core of center-right and center-left politics uh, in Europe since the war um, are now no longer uh, valid or viable um, for many parts of the electorate. So it isn't just a question of not being able to do the grassroots organizing, right? It's not staying in touch with the people, with real people in real places to understand what it is that they need in order to develop policies that actually meet those needs which you then can communicate, right? So fundamentally, I guess, if you have to choose the chicken or the egg, is it the policy or the communication? It's the policy, right? But you don't get to good policies until you actually communicate with real people. And if I had a dollar for every political party chairwoman or chairman that I deal with across Europe who tells me that they know better what the people in the country want than the political, the public opinion data that we're sharing with them says, right, then I would be a rich man, right, and I could be, you know, investing in the Czech Republic, right? But political, it's so difficult um, for political party leaders, particularly in the new democracies, um, to get outside themselves and go out and sit down, you know, with, I keep saying it and I know it's repetitive, but I do it for a reason, real people in real places, right? Because people who sit in capitals do not know better necessarily, right? Great, thank you. Uh, another round of questions. Maybe we can take um, maybe one more and then uh, we'll take some time. Thank you. So I share the long-term uh, optimism that Jan and Clay have expressed. But in the short and middle term, which is what we're working on and what the US-Europe Alliance is working on, I'm afraid I have to be a little bit more on the concerned side. Uh, I'm, Mitchell has pointed out part of the reason for being concerned, one of the reasons for being concerned. I really like the AAA or quintuple A or 10A <laughs> analysis, but the things I'd like to focus on are authoritarianism, the authoritarian offensive is gaining ground in the space that we're talking about, in my judgment. The Freedom House measures should not be ignored entirely, even though they're not the whole story. Uh, so what's the answer? Well, the answer is action <laughs> through alliances, and very, very importantly, and this is the one insight that I'd like to particularly emphasize, and that is assurance, assurances. When I got to Prague and Bratislava in 1992, what I heard from the new emerging leadership after the Velvet Revolution was, we need, we need you to be here. We need to join the EU. We need a strong NATO. Otherwise, the Russians will be back. If we feel the Russians are, if we fear that the Russians are gonna come back, everything bad is gonna happen. Now it's the Chinese and their money to some extent. The, the negative and corrosive influences are so powerful. Uh, please say a little bit more and don't be quite as politically correct or, or tiptoeing on, uh, on eggshells. We're hearing about Ukraine and the whole idea of undercutting the alliance and, 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 uh, and, cor and corrupting rather than uh, working against corruption, which is very corrosive of democracy. I'd like to hear more from Mitchell also on what he sees or doesn't see as the damaging effects of this very severe uh, uh, income disparity that has emerged, uh, as currently measured at least. Some of the measures of the corruption of the, co I agree with your point about the communist regimes being fundamentally corrupt, but there weren't easily political science, sociological, economically measurable ways of showing, quantifying that corruption. So my question is, please comment, but in the short term and in the transatlantic space, short to middle term, what is to be done, the action? I know there's other questions, so I'll try to make this quick. Alexandra, my question for you is regarding Belarus and its transformation as it's going forward. How essential is a popular understanding of national identity as part of that? Because that was key in countries like Poland and Hungary and elsewhere, notably absent in Belarus because it's had a unique history. And how, does, how has that impacted what's yet to be the democratic potential in Belarus being realized? 
And Jackson, I have a question for you. I'm going back about five years where a scholar who's a senior fellow at FPRI by the name of Stephen Kotkin wrote a book called Uncivil Society where he tried to make the case, underline tried, to make the case that civil society did not have the, the degree of, of importance or significance in the changes that happened in 89. And you know, I, obviously having worked for the National Endowment for Democracy for years, I have my own opinions about that, but I'd like to hear from you, you know, particularly in respect to, to, to East Germany, to the GDR, you know, where was civil society there and how, because you, you began by talking about how it was a bit of an accident. Um, maybe it wasn't in the minds of those in the opposition that were operating in a very constricted space, but nonetheless trying to foster democratic change in then East Germany. Thank you. Hi, uh, my question is also for Alexandra um, about Belarus uh, with the talk and possible combination of a Putin uh, merging with Belarus. Is that something that you see going through and actually happening? And I guess it'll also be for Clay. Um, if that were to happen, what, if anything, would or could NATO do uh, to stop that if the situation kind of emulates sort of like the Crimea? Great, I think we'll take some responses and wrap up. You wanna go again first? On, on the NATO question, I'll, I'll leave that to experts in those regions for, the, for that specifically, so I don't step too far out of, my, out of my box. But I can address your comment on this. So the answer is to start promoting democracy at home in Europe and the United States. Okay, now this is easier, easier said than done, of course. So there is an impeachment trial going on right now that I watched part of it, and I fielded calls from both sides of my family, both sides of my family. One, my wife's family, extremely conservative from rural America. My family in a city, very, very liberal, asking me questions about it, right? And I am a professor. I try to maintain I don't take sides. I've never told my students I've, I actually quit voting in federal elections, so I would maintain my objectivity in, in the classroom, right? But so the polarization is a problem. So, so this is what, this is in, for action, this is what needs to be taken action on. So Arthur Brooks at AEI did a lot of talking and work on this while I was there about the act of loving your enemies and having more constructive talk and dialogue between uh, polar, politically polarized groups. Right, so this is where we need to start working on the ground inside America and inside Europe and having cross, uh, uh, cross Atlantic relations and, and, and you know, visits, uh, events, all sorts of types of things that teach people how to talk to each other better about this. Because when I watch things like this and I'm dealing with these phone calls coming back and forth, all I'm saying is I'm saying, look, it doesn't matter what side you're on, if you support it, if you're against it, if you're whatever, it doesn't matter. All I see when I'm looking at it is I'm seeing a distraction that's allowing Putin, Xi, and all of our authoritarian adversaries out there the space to strategize and think about how they're going to harm us worse and how they're going to really mess with our economy, really mess with our elections because we are so distracted on this issue of polarization, right? So that's, that's where the action, I think, can be taken. Can I just pick up because I need to look at the watch? Um, one of the mistakes that I made, I mean, let me first of all respond to your question about the accident. What I meant by an accident was that Shabovsky read this note that night and said that the wall is open. So there was a readiness on the, on the part of, of the public at large. If you remember uh, in East Germany, there have been massive demonstrations in Leipzig and in, in Berlin. So the, the pot was boiling. The accident was the fact that this man managed to kick over a domino that then wound up with all these people in uh, ready to move through the wall. But the ground were already relayed. The, the mistake I made was talking to someone who was one, he was the last foreign minister of the GDR, Marcus Meckel, maybe he's a name that people know, but in any event, he was at the Institute and I asked him, gee, Marcus, where were you on the 9th of, of, of November, 1989? And he said, the question is totally irrelevant because he had created, well before that, the SDP, the, the Social Democratic Party in the East German 
republic. And that was the beginning of the kind of bravery that had spun off of what had happened in Poland, what had spun off of the Hungarians and the Austrians cutting through that, 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 that border. This was a, a buildup that one can't simply say was East Germany. It was all over Eastern Europe. That civil society strength was gaining momentum. And people were simply gaining courage. And by the way, the role of the church in that particular case, with East Germans as Lutherans and the Poles as Catholic. One of the most important events that happened in the 20th century was when a Polish pope came to Warsaw and said, be not afraid. And I think we just underestimate those kinds of civil society structures. And I agree with you that those are the kinds of things that we have to continue to, to, uh, to support. Let me also say, I've got one more A, um, accountability. And I think that to some extent, that's something where I think that we ought to also help civil society with. The accountability, the primacy of domestic politics in terms of foreign policy, I think has gained enormous traction in the last 30 years. Why do I say that? Because in 1989, the internet was founded. The internet became a tool for people to suddenly become involved in their systems. And that's why I agree with Jan when you say it isn't populism, it isn't all bad, because people suddenly found a voice that they were able to get on to use with, with bringing their own people um, who were the elites to accountability. And that's something that I think we have to support. Uh, how you do that in China is beyond me at the moment, but you're certainly seeing how that's happening in Hong Kong. And so, you know, one could, could basically be very, uh, as you are, uh, you know, optimistic about the fact that this, this, this movement that happened, you know, beginning in Poland and then went through Hungary and then wound up in East Germany, that was something that created this, and I wanna use the word again, hubris, about the fact that Fukuyama was right and that we just didn't anticipate the blowback and the asymmetries, another A, that are now facing us now. And I think we need to face that realistically but I don't see uh, that the triumph and the, and the ability to feel like those walls that were brought down, metaphorically as well as real, should be in any way repudiated by the fact that we've now got the AFD and the Bundestag, and we've got the, you know, uh, uh, Orban misusing his power in Hungary. There is every reason to think that those, this, these past 30 years are gonna give us an opportunity to break down more walls, whatever their constituencies are in the future, but we have to understand what our job is here in the United States and in the democracies that still have the backbone to do that. I have to go. <laughs> Thanks very much, and I really wanna say how much we enjoy partnering with you, and I hope we can do this again. This is very important. Thank you. I guess au revoir starts with an A, right? <laughs> um, Ambassador, um, fair points all. Um, you know, I think uh, if uh, maybe just a couple of one word answers with some description. I think first of all, uh, presence, right? Um, uh, I don't wanna uh, blow the role or the potential role or the potential future role or, or impact of uh, the presence of the United States in the region out of proportion. But I think you can make a pretty good argument that um, the, the chances of finding some kind of joint response to challenges to democracy in the region, um, uh, the best way to do that is for Americans and Europeans to work together, and the best way to get that is to have America on the ground present throughout the region. Um, and all I can say, at least with regard to the situation that we're in today, is that um, the ability of places like IRI and NDI um, to be present in the region, and it's not just us, but all of the family of organizations that, that, uh, that, that, that we sort of travel with, we are all much more present today than we were eight years ago when it was extremely difficult to find anyone in the United States government who would pick up a phone and dial uh, somebody in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, 
Uh, and I won't attach any political evaluation to that. I think people can interpret it however they want to. Um, but there is far more funding, there is far more support, there is far more uh, uh, demand uh, for the kind of work that we're doing for the United States to be present in the region today than there has been since the salad days um, back in the beginning in the 90s. Um, we're, we're opening offices where we had to close them before, we're expanding programs, we're hiring people, and to my mind, um, that's a positive. Uh, and it's a positive because um, at the core, if we, are fund if we are ultimately going to protect liberal democracy around the world, the only way that can be done is with the United States and Europe working together, right? Another core value of, of what you're trying to do, Rich and Scott, right? Um, the world's a big place, right? We've got 330 million people in a super powerful economy. Europe has 500 million people in a super powerful economy. Um, but neither of us alone is going to be able to define the future world order, right? Together we have a chance to do it. And that, it seems to me, is what we have to invest in. And to do that, we need to make sure, somebody mentioned exchanges, I don't know who it was, you know, everybody, nobody wants to pay for exchange programs, but they are fundamentally, crucially important, particularly among young political people, right? Um, I go to the German Bundestag relatively frequently and I meet with members of the Bundestag who are under 40 years old and have never been to the United States. How is that possible? How can you get elected to the German federal parliament and never have set foot in the United States? That's our bad. We dropped the ball on that, right? So we need, as I mentioned earlier in my opening, we need to invest in young political leaders around the region to make sure that those ties between the US and Europe are still uh, strong. Um, because that is the core that is ultimately going to be able to continue to define the world order. And if we try to go, go our way alone, it will fail. And if Europe tries to go its way alone, that, you know, the sort of Macron vision right now, it will fail. So I will uh, address a question related to identity and language. Language is a, is a key, play a key role in in a nation's identity. In simple way, people say like, what is nation? Nation is territory, culture, and language. And um, if you look to rhetorics that goes from Russia, we see that in most cases, Russia uses words, Russian people in Latvia, or Rus Russian population in Ukraine. But why they're Russian? Because they speak Russian language. And when changes, uh, when Belarus started to shift towards uh, like alliances with Russia, first thing that happened is a change in the language policies. And this change happened, again, adding the status of constitutional language to, uh, uh, given the status of constitutional language to Russian language. Belarusian people didn't define, uh, cannot define their choice, like what their, what their ma major preference is but they do, um, do, according to censor, they do use Belarusian language at home, and, but less in an institutional settings. And this choice is not actually a choice. It's, a, I would say, legal realities in which they live because the big, uh, uh, because uh, essentially government restrict the usage of Belarusian language. How they can restrict, for example, parents it's, uh, it's uh, parents cannot uh, give education for their, to their children in Belarusian language. To do so, they need to fight. For example, there is such a great institution, uh, NGO in Belarus, Belarusian Language Society, which works on such issues. And the work they do just shows how hard it is to promote uh, Belarusian language, Belarusian language in Belarusian society. Uh, for example, in order to publish a, a book uh, about manual for all the schools in the country, uh, Belarusian geography in Belarusian, they had to collect like 3,000 signatures. One of the example, but there are numerous examples. For example, there are no laws in Belarusian language. Only like treaties, the three treaty rarely used, like signed many, many years ago. There are, uh, there are, it's hard to, for example, to receive administrative services in Belarusian language. And there were cases when Belarusian applicants who filed uh, suit in the courts uh, couldn't uh, have process, uh, judicial processes in Belarusian because uh, and judge actually called for translator, the Belarusian judge called for a translator to translate from uh, 
uh, Belarusian to Russian. So there are like so many precedents just in all the areas of um, in the, all, all the areas of uh, uh, of like uh, of economics, of uh, administrative in in, in in like administrative area, in educational area, in health, that language is not welcome. But this is again not a choice. It's a policy established by the government which wants to affiliate itself with uh, with, with with Russia. Um, it's a big topic. It's a painful topic for Belarus. Uh, but uh, w but uh, those one, those people who um, who fight for Belarusian language and uh, try to promote it and give give it the equal uh, equal level along with Russian in terms of usage in different areas, they believe and uh, they believe that. Just giving an equal status for Belarusian language will bring will 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 give more identity to the nation, because many people ask like who are Belarusians? Are they like white Russians or like why uh, why uh, why nobody knows about your own identity? We know Ukraine, like Poland people know Poland, but they don't know Belarus, and in most cases, identify Belarus as a part of Russia. And uh, because uh, language is one of the elements which just gives a similarity or just don't draw a difference. So uh, I think the change which will come to Belarus, it will be spoken, it's now s uh, spoken in Belarusian language because democratic forces like Belarusian Popular Front, they, um, they use Belarusian language as a language of communication with their voters. But I do, uh, the change will come in two languages, for sure. But I do think that um, new, Belarus, uh, new Belarus will have one, Belarusian. And second question, it was question about merging happening with Russia. So, and um, you ask how realistic it is, right? You ask me how realistic it is. Well, there are all prerequisites um, for the merge. There is no border, there is unification in economies, there is a uh, strong military integration, uh, there is loss of identity in Belarusian society, so such prerequisites exist, unfortunately. But I do believe um, that um, uh, this merge can be avoided and uh, you ask a second question about like what matter NATO can do. So, and I probably ask our, my pan our panelists uh, like what NATO can do to avoid, uh, to prevent this merge between Belarus and Russia. I, I'm afraid we're, we're gonna have to wrap up. We're coming to the end of our time. So, um, uh, I, I, I do want to just respond really briefly to Adrian's question, you know, about inequality. Um, what, what I see, one of the, one of the roots of the, the problem that we're facing today of this lack of confidence in democracy in the region is, is essentially about the economic policies that were pursued after 1989. And, and unfortunately, were heavily promoted by us in the West. And these would be largely, uh, you could label them free market economic policies as promoted by AEI, which would, did a very vigorous job of, of doing that. And also, you know, liberal, or you could call them liberal or sometimes neoliberal economic policies. I mean, basically it refers to the same type of thing. But essentially the whole idea of privatizing the economies and liberalizing the economies. And what those policies did in effect was they, um, they were beneficial to a lot of people. I mean, um, they benefited about 30% of the population of this region, but they devastated 70% of the population, at least 60% of the population, um, really badly to the, to the extent that life expectancy dropped. There were probably tens of millions of excess deaths that occurred at the end of um, communism. And so I think that, that that made people in the communist countries feel that, um, that the promise that they had um, been promised of the West was not achieved for a lot of people. In fact, um, what they got instead was extremely deleterious to their life. Um, and unfortunately, the impact of that has been that people are um, not as open to, um, to the center of parties, right? So you talked about why is the left declining? Well, it's partly because the left failed to stop these policies from happening and, and presided over this massive increase in inequality. 
And so that being that there should be against that, um, that was one of the reasons why people don't trust them anymore. And similarly, the center right, I think, is also not, not trusted as much, um, you know, to preside, preside over those types of policies. And what I see happening in the region is that you have people turning increasingly to extremist parties that are promising um, really kind of pretty standard social democratic policies, actually. So if you look at the economic policy profile of some of the nationalist parties in Europe, they're now promising um, more social, more policies that had been associated with the social democratic left, essentially taking away a lot of their share of the electorate. And um, and and I see that the the challenge, in, in a way, maybe similar to Clay, is that you know the challenges that we have, um, we have, uh, you know, I, I mean, certainly electoral democracy doing well. But we have authoritarian regimes that are offering, they don't run with saying we're offering corruption, of course. They, but what they are offering are, in fact, national development strategies and economic policies that share the wealth more widely um, than the centrist parties have been able to do. And people, I think, are voting for them, and I've written a lot about this in the Polish context, are voting for them because they actually like social democracy and they see that the if the conservative party, the peace, or the whatever you want to call it, Catholic nationalist or nationalist party, the peace, um, supporting those types of social democratic parties, they'll they will vote for them and they'll vote for Orban as long as they're enact you know populist parties that are helping people <laughs> with uh, their economic situation. They're, they're getting the votes, and I, I do share also um, you know uh, Clay's optimism that you know that. Um, this is a battle ultimately which has to also be fought at home in the United States and, and that you know, by attacking corruption at the top of our society and by having these investigations of you know, showing that the United States is still a country where we can tackle corruption at the top of its society among the you know, top political leaders is definitely a good example you know, um, for democracy in the region and something I think we would all applaud. So. We're a little bit over time, but we can maybe talk a little bit afterwards. Um, yeah, but um, I'm happy to stick around for a couple seconds, but we're actually at a little bit over at the moment. So I, d I would just like to th finally thank everybody for, for st sticking with us and for your attention and for coming today. And I uh, hope we can continue these discussions in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you.